the reason we kind of got away from from the single family rental market to begin with was that the market just went crazy and the numbers that just weren't working for us mm -hmm. um and, and it could be that we were super jaded because i think we we House we bought from you, John, back then was like fifteen grand or some shit. Yes. Um, you know these houses now. They're st I mean, it's not it's not a nice neighborhood, but now they're seventy grand. This is the real estate investing experience. We get it. Real estate can be rough sometimes, and that's why we bring in the experts to talk about the experiences you won't hear anywhere else. With your hosts, John Cohen and Chris Grinzik. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Experience. I'm your host, Chris Grenzig. With me as always, John Cohen. How you doing? I'm uh, good. Uh, it's Friday morning we're recording this, or it's Friday. Um, just said you weren't going to mention it. Yeah, no, I, it's not morning. It's Friday afternoon. Uh, it just, you know, I don't even know what day it is, actually, to be honest. The, the day is just, you don't know if it's a weekend. You don't know if it's night. It's morning. It just, everything just rolls into each other. The only thing that changes is whether it's raining or sunny out. That's it. But, uh, and I think we're on week like six or seven of quarantine. It's, it's been, it's gone really fast, but uh, the days, you know, I mean, weeks, days, months, years, my birthday next week. That's the only reason why I know we're in April still because <laughs> <laughs> no one wished me happy birthday, but uh, you know, that's not because April didn't pass us because no one cares. That's, that's true. We could, we could be into mid May. Right. And then, and, and, and I've already, everyone already forgot about me, which is exactly. not a problem. Well, no, I know it's, yeah, we're good. it's been tough. We're good. And now I don't know if you looked, it's supposed to rain like the next I, eight out of 10 days, which is brutal. <laughs> that's the only thing we look forward to. It's like, ah, you know, it's going to be sunny. I'll just go for a walk or so now you know, it's we'll like, sit in the backyard. Not only is it going to be the same day over and over, it's just going to be dreary as well. So mm -hmm. that'll be fun. It's going to be, a, it's going to be a fun ton to, 10 days to get through. Exactly. Um, awesome. But we have this to keep us busy, keep us active, keep us motivated. So happy. We got a uh, two recordings today. Um, got a really great guest on. Going to let him introduce himself. Uh, with that being said, Gabe, thanks for coming on. Sure, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Can you take uh, yeah, just a couple minutes? Who you are, where you're from, your background, and kind of what you do? Cool. Will do. Uh, John, happy belated birthday, first of all. No, no worries. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. You're still young enough that birthdays matter, I guess. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of over it. Hey, I'm, I'm over it too. You know, once you hit 30, you're really like, not. you know, 30, yeah. you know, the next one's 40. Right. And I got, I got some time. So that's good. Good for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm slowly getting there. <laughs> but anyway, uh, my name's Gabe Ploggy. Um, I am a investor in Philly, Philly market. I uh, started buying single family properties in uh, about 2006. So the market back then was fairly similar to the pre Corona market. Um, that we have in Philly now, Philly area, which is uh, pretty crazy. Everything was everything was overpriced, just like it is now. A lot of competition, um, tons of wholesalers, and uh, I kind of had to weed out weed out a lot, a lot of bad deals to find good ones. Um, but I was young then and, and didn't really know much better, and and uh, kind of just jumped in. Um, so I started buying properties with my father in. Uh, section of South Philly called Point Breeze, um, which back then was, was uh, pretty hood. Um, we used to get some crazy looks walking through and walking into houses, especially occupied ones. Mm -hmm. But uh, but since then, it's, it's really taken off. And uh, for a while, it was, we had in South Philly, I think we had a couple of the fastest appreciating uh, uh, zip codes over over a series of time series of years so um since we started buying there we saw some some awesome appreciation which was cool I'm not pretty cash flow right now. so long story short um grew that single family portfolio up to about 50 units or so uh maybe a couple more at this point um we uh I, since then i partnered up with my cousin uh john and uh we uh turned a lot of them over to section eight um, that since they were, back, at least back then, in, in pretty rough areas, kind of, you know, lower income neighborhoods, um, and uh, found kind of our, our niche in Section 8 for, for a good amount of years. And uh, once the market crashed, we were able to scoop up a bunch and, uh, yeah, learned a lot in the process. Um, and since then, we kind of have 
switch gears over to uh, flips and uh, small development in Philly, kind of all over the city in the summer. So that's primarily where we're at with it now. Um, and uh, we're just kind of waiting this Corona thing out and uh, at a standstill. So. Awesome. So, so what, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, I know we're, you're in this Corona world um, and we'll talk about it quickly because everyone's probably sick and tired of it. And by the time this airs, depending, you know, fingers crossed we get closer to the end, but you know, who knows? Um, the development world and where you're at now, how has business changed and what are things you're doing to sort of, I don't want to say figure it out, but to, to, to sort of like backstop whatever's changed in your immediate business. Sure. Um, it's, it's changed. I mean, this is also new and it's, a, it's ever evolving. It's, I mean, I'm sure it is for you guys too up there and uh, everywhere that you guys are investing. Um, but for example, I mean, we literally probably a week before the shutdown, we, we had two deals on the contract um, that our lender – our lenders just backed out. Everybody was spooked. Nobody knew, you know, there's so much uncertainty in the market. Nobody knew what was going on. So they just backed out. We uh, are on the hook as of right now for, for our deposit money. Um, we get it back great. Not really expect to get it back. But we'll see. Um, so that was kind of the short term kind of uh, slap in the face. Um, lend, lenders backing out. The, the um, permanent lending market is kind of up in the air. Uh, as far as refinancing out the deals. Um, uh, but uh, it, to, as, as kind of hedging our bets at this point, we're, we're trying to kind of, we, we're in the middle of some bigger rehabs um, that the price point is, is high for, for uh, the kind of the areas that we're in. Um, so we're doing like third story, it, it, normal growth, Philadelphia Rome's. Um, we're doing some kind of additions, building up stories, adding roof deck, stuff like that. Um, we've since uh, somewhat altered and, and switched gears and made a pivot to knocking that job down to a smaller, smaller, more manageable rehab, scope of rehab. Um, so we're not into these deals for as much money. Um, not only that, but it's, I think at this point, it's really important to uh, come in at, at the lowest price point that we can um, just because we're not sure what that, what that $600,000 market is um, in Philly when, when we come out of this. We don't know what the, what the total economic impact and, and people losing their jobs is going to be. Um, so that's, that's one thing we've been doing, kind of scaling down. Um, we haven't necessarily been – been looking to buy right away and uh, we're kind of waiting it out and uh i'm waiting to see how things shake out because i'm sure j just like us a lot of other investors are, are have been waiting for the uh for the correction in the market anyway and this seems like a good place for that to happen so once we come out of this we see some opportunities and uh are able to start um start buying again so it, it could work out for the best so 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 post so you guys are, you know, more or less excited for the future of you know, the, the opportunities that could be available, you know, pending, you know, no one likes a bad situation, but, you know, let's call a spade a spade. Anytime you're in real estate, I mean, that's, I would say you're taking advantage of people's misfortunes, but, you know, some people, you know, things are going to happen and it's, that's just life. Uh, you guys are prepared and ready for that, you know, whether the lending world's a little different or whatever it is, but you guys are, you know, looking forward to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, on top of that, to be honest, there's a, there's a lot of competition now that probably uh, we we really would rather not deal with. Um, uh, more competition, obviously, the higher the prices are going, and that's gotten to that point where the deals are kind of hard to come by, and a lot of people were getting bailed out by the marketplace for for a lot of years, um, buying just purely on the fact that the, the house in January is is, is going to be worth one one price at the rehab it. Um, and then they're banking on it being 20% higher in, in June when the rehab's done, when it hits the market or whatever. So um, I think the, the slight correction, hopefully, it, in our area, will we'll spook away uh, some, of those, some of those guys who 
guys and girls who, who um, kind of jumped in just because everything was crazy hot. And, uh, yeah. No, I mean, that's – so, you know, I, I we met – you know, I don't even remember. It was probably 2014, or I, it, it maybe even you know 15, or right around there. While I was buying tax stuff at the tax auction, and yep. I stopped going. Uh, you know, our, our business, pick, you know, the, the multifamily stuff is really starting to pick up really well. But uh, I remember sitting at the auction, and you know, early on, you were buying stuff for nothing, right. and then it just became completely unaffordable where I was like, you know, how, you know, looking, you know, the process there, you couldn't really, you're not supposed to see the houses or, you know, go into the houses. And I remember watching people bid and I'm like, that that's never going to work. And it was just, and that was 2000, whatever, 15, 16 in that range. Yeah. I can only imagine what it's like from, from that point on. Cause the last four years or the last three years and two years have been out of control. So um, and you know, you've been doing it for quite some time, so I can only imagine what you guys have seen and with all, with everything that's out there. So it's gotta be, uh, you know, the same way I feel, you know, in 2016, I was telling people the, you know, the multifamily world was, you know, who knew where it was going to go. Um, but now, you know, I don't want to say I'm licking my chops, but it's, it's interesting to see how this thing shakes out and what could be on the future. No, I, I completely agree. Like that's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, Obviously, you guys know, just like the, the uh, residential world, the multifamily world is crazy saturated, too. So, um, yeah, everybody's looking for that kind of correction. Anybody who knows knows what they're – some of what they're doing. It, it, 100%. Um, Do you guys have a preferred – because you have some rentals, you're doing some flips. Is there something that – you know, you, well, you, I know when you started, it was it was in an area, you know, in South Philly – and you've grown since then. Is there something that you guys prefer doing or is there a, you know, a why you're doing what you're doing in the certain areas or is it just sort of, you know, what, you know, you look at a deal that comes in and you make a decision based on the deal and where it is. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, we're, at this point we're, we're a lot more selective with neighborhoods, um, especially, especially for rentals, uh, obviously. Um, recently we, we uh, decided to buy a few, single families um, and our exit strategy there was just going to be to jump into the uh, short-term rental market. So that was awful timing on our part. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we had the same conversation. It was funny, probably, you know, Chris went about six, seven months, maybe eight months ago. Uh, and Chris has a, a buddy that uh, is doing it pretty well. You know, I'll give him a shout out, Jonathan Farber. Um, and when we looked at it, we're like, this is really interesting. This really makes some sense. And the corona sort of just turned the water off quickly, right? It wasn't like a slow and steady buildup. It was just sort of a stop. But we, we spoke about that for a while. Like, you know, this could be good. You know, we could buy a place in, you know, Jacksonville Beach where where we own multifamily or something. And we didn't do anything. Uh, I had someone that came to me that wanted to do a, 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 a apartment in the city and sublet apart, uh, units out, which mm -hmm. would have been disastrous, although you don't have to pay rent technically. Um, but, yeah, no, it was uh, – we, we went down the same path. We didn't, we didn't do anything though. So, you know, whether you know, good, bad, or indifferent. Sure. Yeah, we didn't do it because we saw the crash coming. Yeah. It's been interesting though. I've spoken to a couple of people that are doing it and anybody that's in like an urban area has been getting crushed and anybody that's in like a remote area is getting like these all like this awesome demand for like quasi longer stay. So not like, Sure. three days, five days, like a month to three months because people just want to get the hell out of the cities. So it's been, yeah. it's been really interesting to see. I thought it would just get crushed in general. Um, but a lot of people in like suburban rural areas with some space have been doing really, really good. Like tons of booking, tons of interest, stuff like that. So I thought that was interesting. That is, that's not, that's a great point. Yeah. I can definitely see how, uh, how you want to get out of the city. I definitely do at this point. Yeah. Whatever I can get. No, I mean, that's for me personally, I was living in Brooklyn and I came out to my mom's place, you know, hour and a half out on Long Island, you know, was it God, uh, five weeks ago, maybe now, Jeez, yeah, it's probably. been that long. Yeah. Um, but it was like, yeah, it was just like, you know, getting out of the city was, you know, I had to get a, a gentle shove from my parents to do it, but you know, definitely the right move in hindsight. Cause it's apparently, you know, just a ghost town and you're packed in like you know sardines and everything and you got no room and you know who has what and you know public transit and stuff like that so yeah i mean people 
flocked out of the city like crazy. I know, John, I don't know if you saw, but Chris Jackson said something about like the amount of people that are already permanently moving out of the city into Long Island and Westchester is like crazy. Like the, the growth has just been astronomical. Yeah, you've seen stuff that you haven't seen. The trend was going the other way for so long, right? I have two cousins that were actually supposed to move into Manhattan uh, during this whole thing. And they reached out to me. They're like, oh, can you read this lease? Can you help me out? And I was like, I'm t- I don't have to read the lease. I'm telling you right now, you can bail. The landlord's got no fucking recourse whatsoever. Like, yeah. there's what are they going to do? And she's like, are you sure? I was like, you want to send me the lease? I'll look at it. But I wasn't going to look at it. I was going to just get an email and call it back an hour <laughs> later. But but I said, yeah, there's no recourse. And then, you know, so they wrote an email and said, well, we'll move your move into, you know, April 15th. And this was in March when, you know, who knew it was going to be this late into April. Uh, so she's like, oh my God, the landlord gave in. And, you know, and they said, if you don't move in April 15th, we're going to charge you until we're able to lease the apartment. I was like, that's not going to happen either. Just tell him, you know, you're canceled. Then he emailed back like an hour later and he was like, if you guys want to cancel the whole transaction, don't worry about it. But, you know, they were just about to move in. They were so excited to move into the city there. You know, they're 24 and 26 or something like that. So they were, they were so excited to move to the city. And then it was just right. like, oh, we don't want to go. We don't want to go. You know, we got to move in. We got to move all our stuff. And um, and you're in a 600, 700 square foot apartment, maybe an 800 square foot apartment and no outdoor space, no nothing. Um, I don't know. I, I said it all the time. I, I shit talk my house all the time and say, I wish I never bought it. Hmm. But if I was still living in an apartment with the baby, with my wife, you know, I don't know, you know, thank God we have the backyard and, and we have more space because it would be, uh, you just, you know, you're just cooped up in a little place with nothing to do. I mean, it's got to be, it's got to be intriguing. And, and the trend is just reversed completely. I mean, sure. everyone went into the city and into those areas. And now people are trying to stay away, which is going to be an interesting dynamic when this goes away. Uh, when it goes away, you know, are people going to move back? Is it going to take a little bit longer for them to go back? Are people, are businesses adapting to the virtual working and everyone working from home? Um I'm even sure, you know, you know, doing what you guys are doing, you know, forget the rehab side of stuff, but uh, how has the virtual world been just, you know, I'm sure you guys aren't looking at new deals or you might be looking at new deals, but nothing's going to happen. What, you know, how's the virtual side of the world changed what you guys do? Cause I know, you know, from a rehab, you know, you could still drive a property and say, okay, yeah, good, not enough, but you can't really get into it um, or on a wholesale or on a rental. Has that impacted anything or can you see any benefit to it? you know, when you come out of this? Um, it's a good question. It's kind of, t- I think it might be too, too early to tell, John. Um, I mean, if this, you know, we're still, we're still trying to be involved right now. Honestly, we're, we're still driving around to our, to our current jobs. And, um, you know, if technically right now, we're not allowed to work at all in Philly. Um, hopefully, I think May 8th or May, I've heard both May 8th and May 1st that they're turning back the, uh, the we're going to be allowed to do construction. But um, uh, we, we've been doing a little stuff that we can, um, not so much using technology because, right now, I mean, closings, yeah, if we have closings, we'll be able to do that remotely. And hopefully that, that opens that up because going to closings at, at a title company, is, it, there's no re- real reason for it. Um, it's, it's the multifamily world is totally different. Like we just do everything, you know, you sign it, you go to your attorney's office, he signs, notarize it, but you know, you do that two days, a day before the closing, the single family world just has not adapted to that. When I, yeah. Yeah. When I bought my house, my dad's like, well, we have a closing and you know, Steph has to, I'm like, what? Well, yeah. Why can't I just sign this, notarize it and send it somewhere? Why does everybody, but it's still that way. Cause you know, we've had a ton of people on here, you know, in the fix and flip world, attorneys, whole nine yards. And the single family world still has everybody go into a room and get everything done. And I just think right. that's mind blowing. It is. No, it's crazy. I mean, our, our last quote, we, we luckily snuck in a, a uh, closing that on a property we, we flipped. Um, and luckily we got it in before it r- shit really went down and uh, they, they did the, cl- well, it did go down, but uh, they did the closing through the front window of the house. Like literally <laughs> the guy was leaning out with a, with a pen the front window and the uh the title guy the title agent was there on the other side so i mean it's gonna i don't know it's definitely gonna shake shake things up um technology technology wise i it's too early for me to say if that's gonna change our model at all or change the day-to-day um activities for for us just you know we're still kind of we're trying to be not hands-on right now but whatever we can do 
to try to get done. No, but then, you know, we were not able to use it. We're not even able right now to leverage technology to get us through. Gotcha. So before this, you guys were obviously on a certain path, whether it was more fix and flip developments, whether it was, you know, section eight, or maybe you guys were having thoughts about how to like change things up or shift it. Um, has this whole experience changed how you guys are looking at things, changing the direction you're going to go? Are you going to go back more to your roots of picking up more section eight? Cause you know, most people I've spoken to with, you know, section eight or some sort of voucher tenants, they're paying and, you know, paying on time as compared to the free market. It's, you know, a whole spectrum of what people are doing. Um, has anything shifted in what you guys are thinking or not yet? You took the question uh, right out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it has, it has, um, you know, we, we've just like, I, I kind of touched on it before, but, but scaling, scaling down on, on rehabs and, and, uh, kind of, uh, just overall capital, capital investment in, in projects we're doing. Um, we, we'd like to be at a, when we come out of this, one thing we've learned is that, you know, we're at these higher price points, well, relatively higher, not, in, not New York standards or, or where you guys are at, but a seven, $700,000 row home in Philly, it, it's, that'll get you a lot of house. Um, and that's not necessarily the best market to be in, in, in this environment, clearly, because, you know, we, again, we just don't know if that buyer is going to be there once this shit comes to an end. So we'd like to um, get back into s kind of smaller deals, possibly for the, for the smaller, but, but more volume. Um, and, and like you said, Chris, possibly just it the reason we kind of got away from from the single family rental market to begin with was that the market just went crazy and the numbers that just weren't working for us anymore. Mm -hmm. um and, and it could be that we were super jaded because i think we, we the house we bought from you john back then was like 15 grand or some shit yes. um, you know these houses now they're just, i mean it's not it's not a nice neighborhood but it, now they're 70 grand so it's like <laughs> and the, the, the rent, the, the rent hasn't changed. So, like, what, how, how, how are you going to do that? So you're saying John messed up? It, it, yeah, no, I, I joke about it all the time. I did I, did I? I don't think it. No, it was the neighbor. We bought a. I bought a lot in Point Breeze at auction, and you, with you guys were in mind at some point. I was like, oh, this is perfect, right? And then the right. neighbor was at the auction and actually just came over to me and bought it for like forty five grand, whatever. But. You know, the, I think the house that we sold you, I think we bought it at auction for like 4,600 bucks or 4,800 bucks. Exactly. And, you know, I remember, you know, those days, I joke about it all the time, but I used to knock on doors like this because yeah. I had no idea what was behind the door. And oh, that yeah. house, is, those tenants were great. I mean, they, sure. were, they, were, they were really good people. You know, they were paying their rent. The landlord just, or the owner just didn't pay the taxes. And I never even, I don't even know what happened to the guy. I mean, he's nothing. But you know, and then we sold it. I was like, oh, wow. You know, back in the day, you know, 4,000 and you know, it was maybe a month, not even whatever, exactly. you know, sold it for 15 grand or whatever it was. I mean, that's a great return. Yeah. Hindsight. Okay. Maybe I could, you know, hold it for five years old for 70. It's great. But I say it all the time. It's like at that point in time, you know, you never can foresee that area being a $70,000 house. I mean, it's just not that night. It's just, the neighborhood yeah. just doesn't afford it. And those tenants could never afford those properties. It's a strictly rent. Sure. You're yeah, not yeah. going to find it. So, but yeah, it's just, it's interesting to see that. Cause like you said, you know, if you were to bought that with the rental that you were getting at 75, 70 grand, it makes significantly less money. And that property, unless the market continues to go up, you know, that property is a $50,000 house, $40,000 house or whatever it was, sure. you just, it wasn't going to, you know, it wasn't going to come out. So it's, uh, it's interesting to see, to hear, cause a lot of people talk about, you know, the volume is not what they want. They want quality and do less deals, which is probably one reason why yet, yeah, you know, you maybe had to go into the bigger developments or the, or the, or the bigger rehabs. Cause it's like, okay, yeah, we'll be in it for 500 or 600 we'll solve for 700 or something like that, where it's like a nice chunk of change as opposed to the, the volume where you're doing deals for five, 10, 15 grand or, or rental income or whatever it is. So it's interesting to hear that. Cause a lot of people want to, you know, I want to do less and make more. And instead of, I want to do more, and that was the core business. So it was a good question by Chris because I wanted to ask that question. Hopefully, you know, what, what I'm hearing is that, you know, this shakes out some of the people that were overpaying and you guys get back to what you like doing, which was that, you know, lower, you know, more volume rentals, section eight, less rehab, a little bit more of a, 
crisper, quicker turn as opposed to something, you know, big and elaborate, which, you know, the stuff in Philly, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, you have roof decks, private backyards, and you're right, $700,000 for a row home, you know, a lot of money. And, you know, that buyer pool, who knows what they're going to be like, you know, six months from now. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that's a great point. Um, we, yeah, long story short, we'd love to get back into those, those smaller deals just at the right price point. And, um, and I think we will, there, there's, there's just so much better. I mean, we, we just, we had it down fairly, fairly well. Um, so we, we could roll from deal to deal. You know, it's not, it, obviously the lower, lower income rentals, you know, we made ours nice. We made ours better than everybody else made theirs. And we're still into it for, you know, like 20 grand or something, you know, the, the, the rehab amounts just weren't, weren't killing us. So it, it worked out. Um, so, and the numbers are great. And, uh, yeah, if we could get back into that after this, after this, uh, ends, that, that would be, uh, definitely a welcome addition back to our portfolio. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. And just, uh, find a, other than that, just wait and see how it, how it does shake out. It's, yeah. I think that's one of the unintended consequences that I hear more of the <clears throat> developer rehabber space talk about of like construction costs and the labor pool being, right. you know, much more palatable for the owners. Um, you know, as we come out of this, there's going to be a lot of rehabs, flips, developments that are going to be on pause and there's going to be a you know, ton of people looking for jobs. So, you know, probably your cost of rehabs and, you know, things like that is probably going to come down a good deal, especially if now, you know, just look at the, you know, the price of oil has plummeted as, you know, supply has gone up and there's literally no demand right now you yeah. know, for the next 18 months, the cost is going to be so low compared to what it was three, four months ago. You know, the same thing's probably going to happen for a lot of different materials. I have no idea what anything costs. I have no idea the supply and demand, but just from a, you know, 30,000 foot view, I got to imagine that's going to happen in a lot of places. Have you guys talked at all about that? Yeah. I mean, that, it just, it, it makes sense just every, when everything falls in line. Um, you know, if there's not that, that much demand for, for quality labor, like, I mean, right now the contractors are, they're, they're making kill. Um, and, and it's impo- just like it always is, but even more so now it's impossible to find really good ones who you, who you trust and, and can work with, you know, on a, on a regular basis and not just one off deals. Um, so yeah, I mean, to that end, hopefully that, uh, that does happen. And, and we're looking forward to that too. Um, that's, you know, that's a huge part of our business. And since, since we kind of pivoted to, to the flip side of things, um, and bigger rehabs, it's been really challenging. Um, you know, we've had, we've had some, some really good contractors who, who we've been able to, we've been able to kind of work with through the years. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, material prices have, have gone crazy and just general labor prices have gone crazy, especially in Philly. And I'm sure it's like that, you know, in other bigger markets too. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I, I hope that is one, one kind of uh, benefit that comes out of this as well. Yeah, because I feel like you know, the birds, because a lot of people now are, you know, are contractors, they can do the work because, you know, the, the you know, the, the, the labor market for that stuff is crazy. I mean, I even spoke to our manager in Jacksonville yesterday or, or the day before, uh, we, you know, we went through our whole capital plan for a deal we just bought. We were pushing things to like phase two, phase three, where we didn't want to spend the money up front. And then, you know, we, you know, we found out yesterday that, you know, our investors actually coming into the deal with, they were going to come in with 800, but they're actually coming in with a million three on Monday. So I said, okay, well, you know, we have way more money than we thought. Uh, we can do the capital faster. And she said, it actually makes sense because all I have our contractors calling us daily. I got no work. I got no work. Right. She said, I could probably get a 15 to 20% discount from the original quotes. So I said, you know, okay, all exterior work, if we budgeted 300,000 and we can get $60,000 saving by saving 20%, do it, right? Yeah. So I told her, I said, we have more money than we thought, so go for it. Like go guns blazing on, uh, you know, the stuff that has to get done anyway, the parking lot, the tree trimming, stuff like that. If I can save money now, I told her go for it. So I think that's something that coming on the flip side of this is going to be really entertaining to, to see, you know, those numbers start coming more in line on what they should be 
and not, you know, what they are, because I know the, the fix and flip world, uh, you know, we have a, we have a friend, you know, uh, here that talks about it all the time. It's not finding deals is, you know, one thing, finding money is one thing. Those are not the hard things. After you find the deal, you find the money, find a guy that can do the work. That's actually good at it. Right. You know, contractors are the, 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 the death of this business because they're, you know, even on deals that we're doing, I mean, that, you know, Chris, I don't know if you saw the email about uh, the flooring in, in the, the River City buildings, but just, you know, it's just incompetency across the board, across them. And I'm not, you know, no offense to any contractors. I have really good contractor friends, but they are just a weak link, like 9.5 out of 10 times. No, nah, dude, I, I, yeah, I completely agree. It's been a big, I mean, it's a challenge for everybody, but uh, especially in a hot market, it's even more because, you know, sometimes you have to stretch and you got to, you got to vet new guys. You got to try new guys and you can get as many referrals as you want, but like, you know, it's still a risk. Yep. So it's, tough. It's, it's after, you know, a referral helps, but then the real personality comes out when they're on the job. And that's, yeah. the, thing, that's the hardest thing to manage for sure. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it too is probably in the last few years, you know, there was just such a demand for all the stuff that I'm sure just got overwhelmed by the demand and they were able to cherry pick and just, you know, you're able to be a little bit looser in how you ran things because you could get away with it because people still needed you and things like that and probably took on more business like a lot of people, right? But John, as you're alluding to, it wasn't necessarily tough to find deals and find money. You know, find deals and money that work together wasn't necessarily the easiest thing. But, you know, there was tons of demand out there. And now all of a sudden, or tons of supply out there. And now all of a sudden, you know, the supply flipped off overnight. Well, now it's going to you know, force people to, you know, tighten their ships, you know, have a competitive advantage and have those things in place that, you know, maybe they haven't been doing or haven't been able to do for the past couple of years. Cause I mean, even for us, I mean, there's things that fell by the wayside that we could have done better from a processing system or operational system just for the company itself that, you know, didn't really have a ton of time to do kind of took a backseat to, find a new business. And now it's like, okay, well, we're stuck inside. Let's take care of that stuff now. So when we come out of it, it's done. I'm sure it's the same thought process for a lot of people. So I wouldn't be shocked if that's one of the things that changes coming out of it. No, I mean, that completely makes sense. Um, so, I mean, it, we, when we met with you guys, I don't know if you were there that time, Chris, but John, we met you in uh, Cincinnati. Yeah, no, Chris was with us. We, we met in Cincinnati and then we drove up to Columbus. That's mm -hmm. right. Shit. That, that, that's right. Yeah. I couldn't remember if that was a different trip or what, but I, I, I remember meeting both of you guys. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that was the big hold up on that, on that one job. Um, yeah, no, that, that deal. Yeah. And by the way, we've come, we, we refinanced. That deal is actually doing really, really well. Um, that's awesome. I, that was an awesome property. Yeah, we actually... That thing actually turned out, uh, you know, it appraised really well. We refied right before this disaster, but that was a project that, you know, the you know, three contractors later, it finally got done. But I mean, pulling teeth and the incompetency all around was just mind blowing to me. Sure. Yeah. Um, that, but, that's been a fun one to watch from 10 oh, feet away with a long pole. I, I, you know, that was one of the biggest clusterfucks. Yep. On, you know, all over the place, but you know, the learning experience you get on the cluster Fox are the ones that, you know, help you succeed on the next one. Cause I learned things on that project that we never made those mistakes again going forward. So, uh, you know, it teaches you to weed out, you know, shitty investors. It teaches you to weed out shitty contractors. It sure. teaches you, uh, you know, the right way to do things. But, uh, yeah, no, that was, a, that was a heavy one. And the deal we toured in Columbus, that shit hole. Um, yeah. I, that deal actually ended up selling for way more money I think I forwarded it to Chris when, when, you know, it was like a year later or something, some idiot bought it. That's probably regretting it right now. But um, that was the, that was the SWAT team property, right? Yep. The, the, the team where the owner called the SWAT team to on himself. Cause it was so rough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, that was uh, fun. Now that was a, uh, that was an eye opening property. That's, that's for sure. For shit, sure. What was. year was that? 27, 17, 20. maybe yeah. 2008, 17, 18, give or take. Yeah. Yeah, that was early on for me too. So that was that was eye opening. Um, was, I, yeah, I think you had just been just come out of the kind of the flip, or you you were thinking about doing getting into flipping, and then kind of shifted into multifam. Yeah, so it was probably because like I started with you guys August two thousand sixteen mm -hmm. officially, 
I, it was probably early. It wasn't that cold. I remember that. Mm-hmm. I feel like we were in like jeans and a sweatshirt or something, maybe even short. So probably like Might have been 17. spring 2017, if I had yeah, to guess. Very well could have been. So yeah, that was a while ago. Yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure that property's a disaster at this oh, point. Yeah. Um, I'm interested too. I'm going to go a little bit off the track because I think having a lot of your, are, are, do you live in Philly as well? I don't know if I caught that. I do. Yeah. Okay. I live in South Philly kind of, uh, I could walk to like, uh, Eagles and Eagles and, uh, any sports games. So two part question, but <clears throat> a couple people I've spoken to, especially when they live and invest in an area, they've started talking about the possibility of like, you know, adding additional revenue streams. And one of the ways they're looking at it is like small businesses. So whether it's, you know, laundromats, bars, restaurants, retail shops, things like that. Um, one, have you done any of that before? And two, is that something you guys have started talking about of like, Hey, we know this bar was crushing it six months ago and we heard the owners in a tight spot. You know, maybe we can come in float them for the next six to 12 months until it picks back up. And then, you know, we'll have some equity in a really good, you know, bar or something like that. Is that a, a thought process, a conversation you guys have had at all or not really? It, it, it has, it has come up actually. Um, and it's really interesting you say that it, there's, we've talked about not so much bars to be honest or restaurants. Cause it, they seem like a headache. Yeah. Um, They're tough. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, even just open like we have there's a section of South Philly called Grace Ferry, which is um Point Breeze kind of gentrified and, and took off and then Grace Ferry it South Philly wise is, is sort of the, the next spot. Um we we have we have a bunch of rentals up there and um we've talked about that. Just just even buying a corner building, opening up a uh, a small coffee shop, just to have a staple up there, even if we're not making a dollar on it. Just to just to be able to do a bottle shop, do a coffee shop, something that that you know improves the neighborhood, make you know gives gives uh just improves it overall. And and uh, even if we're not making any money, but it's it sort of goes back to making your own market in that in that respect. Where if you buy enough and you, and you add enough to the uh, to the surrounding area that, that you're focusing on, then after that, you know. It, it kind of takes off as, as quickly as you want it to, as long as the demand's there for, for uh, new renters or, or new buyers. So like, yeah, even if it's a, a, even if we treat it as a loss leader for us and, and, uh, and we don't make any money or, or lose money, but overall in, in, in the long term, it opens up, it attracts more, more uh, young professionals or more families or, you know, it just attracts yeah, more attention. Exactly. To the, to the it would area. be a way to like add gasoline to a gentrification, right? Where if you had a couple of those, Yes, you may run a place, you may break even, maybe maybe you do a mixed use where you have, you know, a coffee store downstairs, a couple tenants upstairs. So I don't care if the coffee store makes money or not, but it's something trendy and hip and modern that you can get the right people living in the area. You know, yeah. that will help everything as well. So I think that's, I mean, that's awesome. I mean, I, I've always thought, you know, there was, you know, when I was in Philly, I thought it would be, there's so many cool places to do something like that. Um, you know, and it would be really intriguing to see someone take that. I know there are people that do it in other areas and and it's really, it it would be really cool. And, you know, to Chris's point, you know, there is something to be said right now about, you know, a a really good business that just running on some struggling times, you know, that could be a way to do it as well in that area where you come and say, Hey, you know, we'll partner here because we own 20 properties and, you know, we want to be a part of the gentrification. So, you know, know, give me a little bit of the business or something, whatever it may be. So I think that's intriguing and, you know, you know, an interesting component to any real estate business. Cause I think, you know, a lot of the times you get so focused on just the real estate component of it, but like something like that could be really, you know, interesting to add to, you know, a portfolio, especially if you're local to the area. It'd be okay. difficult for me to go buy a coffee shop in Jacksonville because quite frankly, I don't give a shit. Right. <laughs> um, but if you're local to the area and you own some real property that could help turn it around, um, that would be something that I would definitely be all over if I was, you know, inclined to, you know, want to see appreciation. And, you know, that's another way of forcing appreciation a little bit different than going in and, you know, renovating an apartment and leasing it up or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. It's a longer term view. And I think it's it's definitely smart. I think what's important though, too, is one of the conversations I've been having with people is I'm sure there are 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in a similar position to you that are having the same thoughts. And I think where that along the same path kind of runs into an issue is people want to talk about valuations of properties coming out of it. If there's capital that's been on the sidelines or in the wings, and now it's going to be starting to be diverted into other things, whether it's small businesses or, you know, different areas and things like that, you know, that's just going to be less demand for what's out there and the capital that it does stay and does look for, you know, the single family rentals or the fix and flip areas, that's just going to continue to drive, you know, valuations down or hold it at a certain level longer because it's going to become more of a, you know, quote unquote buyer's market over the next, you know, however many months or years, if money's being funneled into these other things. And I think that's, I was really curious to hear it from your standpoint, because I think it's a very granular example of, you know, here's one guy who's been doing real estate in Philly for so long. And if he's having these thoughts, you know, how many other people are having those thoughts? And yeah, maybe you never do it, right? But maybe you pass on a deal you would have otherwise bought if you weren't having those thoughts. Or maybe, you know, there's 50 other guys just like you, and you're one of the 45 who doesn't, but there's five people that do, and that takes X amount of dollars off the table, which right. makes it a little bit easier for you to buy that property and the price a little bit softer than what it would have been. And I think where everybody's talking about like, I, at first, because it was for me as well, at first I was having the thought of like, hey, you know, all these small businesses are going to close, but there's going to be capital waiting in the wings to come in, swoop them up and get them back going. And, you know, maybe, you know, only 20 or 15% stay closed for the foreseeable future. And then I started thinking, okay, well, if that money's going there, where's that money coming from and how does that affect everything else? So I think it's just another thing people need to think about as, you know, properties are becoming available and opportunities and things like that. There's just going to be less capital as, you know, money's being lost artificially over the last three months, whether it's, you know, small business, real estate, or, you know, I'm sure tons of other ventures, stock market, stuff like that. It's just going to hurt everything. Um, so it was interesting to hear your thought process on it. Cause I think there's gonna be a ton of people thinking very similarly. Sure. And I think you're exactly right. I, I think a lot of people, I mean, people are doing that in Philly already and in certain neighborhoods and, and, uh, I agree. Um, if, if somebody beats us to, to that, to that coffee shop or to that mixed use building, then, then, you know, it, it still benefits us in the long run because, you know, we're not the ones who are taking a loss, you know, in theory they are, uh, but we get to reap the benefits of, of their work in a way. Um, but yeah, as far as, as far as capital goes, we're, um, we're kind of bullish that, that everything, it, at least in our small world will, uh, will come back, come back to us and, and um, and we'll be able to get investors again once once there's a slightly more certainty in the market. But uh, but yeah, as as of right now, I agree with you. It's a it's a weird time that that money that was going one place is now uh, being diverted somewhere else. And, and what happens in that in that spot? Like, it, is it gone? I, I mean, it's just weird. It's it's tough to think about. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Good question. Over my head. No, for sure. I, I, I wasn't looking for an answer. Just I it just thought it was interesting because I had a couple a couple other people say the same thing, and they're like, well, you know, we're looking at this, we're looking at that. You know, we've even talked about messing around and being like, oh, do we look at, you know, do we possibly look at hotels or retail centers because they're getting butchered? You know, John's been saying the amount of people that have reached out to him about doing distressed debt funds has been astronomical. So it's like, okay, if if all these people that were more you know, let's call it traditional or in one lane are starting to think about branching out. How does that affect everything? Does it draw capital away? Is it dumb money that comes in and overspends and maybe it helps lift valuations? Like maybe the store owner who, instead of restarting his business that makes a 10% profit margin says, screw it, I'm going to go buy the building instead. And I'm willing to take, you know, where you would have wanted, you know, call it, you know, a 50% expense ratio. He used to have, you know, a 90%. And he's like, oh, well, you know, 45 is great or 55 is great. And he'll slightly overpay for what you would like. 
I don't know the answer to that. You know, like just because capital is flown one way doesn't mean it's not flown back the other way. Like exactly. all these people that got crushed in hotels, maybe they're like, you know, fuck hotels. Like I'm never buying a hotel again. Mm-hmm. I'm putting all my money into multifamily and or student housing. And then, you know, those areas do really well. Like I, I just don't know. And, sure. but I thought it was interesting to hear from our side where we do have some of that. And, you know, you are in that position to hear your thought process of like, Hey, you know, there is a small part of me that would love to, you know, potentially do something outside of our norm. You know, it wasn't like it would have been different if you'd said, now nah, we, you know, we stick to our lane. We do what we want to do. We're doing, you know, we're going to try to pick up as many section eight rentals for old pricing as we can just continue to grow that and buy in areas we think can really pop and let other people figure it out. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, I don't think it's right or wrong either way, but it was just, I, I've heard the same theme a couple of times. So it was very interesting for me to hear that from you. So. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, I'm not, I, just like you said, I, I don't know if it's, if it's the, the right way to kind of not be completely focused um, on something like section eight rentals or, or whatever you're focused on in business, but, or in this business, but for us, we try to stay nimble and uh, yeah, sort of look for the next opportunity. Um, at the same time, not not spread ourselves too thin, which is kind of the challenge. That's that's the delicate balance because yeah. it's easy to get the shiny object syndrome. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, you know what works, but at the same time, you know the amount of people that have reached out to me to start distressed debt funds to go buy debt. Mm. You know, now I start thinking, okay, now every idiot's doing that. You know, yes, there are people that do it that know what they're doing. Um, that can pivot, but at the same time, you don't want to lose, you don't want to lose focus on what you know works and, but you want to be a little different. So it's, you know, I like to hear when people are talking about it. Um, I like to see who the people are that are talking about it to see if it's just someone just, you know, shiny object syndrome, we're going to go buy bowling alleys. Right. Mm -hmm. But, uh, no, I think the way you were coming about it was right. It's like, Hey, yeah, no, even if it loses money, but it helps gentrify, we'd be into that in a niche area in, you know, in a specific location. It's not like I'm going to go buy coffee shops throughout Philadelphia. It's, you know, we own here. We think it would be cool. We think it would help. You know, that's a different spin to the question Chris asked that I think is, you know, an intelligent way to look at it. Who knows what happens? None of us know. We're not that smart. Um, But uh, I think it was a good, you know, a good point of view from, from your standpoint, being a local in the area, sees the gentrification, says, you know, this could be a shot in the arm. You know, maybe we find the right person to do it with. Yeah. Yeah. I think too, it's like, you know, there is a delicate balance between like not spreading yourself too thin, but when you've been doing something for, you know, five to 15 years, depending upon when you started and different points, you have the ability to do those things significantly quicker and faster. The amount of time you're going to spend analyzing a single family rental um, in an area you already own versus a potential coffee shop, you can go through a significant more amount of deals in the same time as you can for that coffee shop mixed use development. So the amount of time you can partition off into new areas can be such a small percentage while you still have most of your business running on the side. So that's where the delicate balance of, you know, if you'd said, yeah, you know, we're going to look in, you know, you know, these opportunities in Philly and, you know, Pittsburgh and Allentown. And, you know, then it would have been like, okay, that's like a lot. And, you know, you might lose focus on your core business, but again, who knows, but yeah, no, I agree with John. I think it was a, it's a good way to make sure you're not spreading yourself too thin. And it also plays off of, you know, all the other stuff you're doing. Cause yeah, I mean, people just go, Hey, why are they like, let's, you know, instead of like something that's similar, but plays off and is slightly different. There's people that just shift at, you know, the drop of a hat and just go in a totally different direction. And it's like, how are you going to continue to keep up what you're doing and, you know, grow that at a decent pace while you're spending so much time and energy on this other thing. So no, I think it makes a ton of sense. Um, no, it's interesting. Um, I think that's probably a really good place to wrap things up. I think people are going to get a lot out of it. I know we focused a lot on the here and now, but I think it's straight into, you know, even the past and how things related and, you know, stuff like that. So I think people get a ton of value. Um, Gabe, thanks so much for coming on. I think, you know, this was really great ton of value. People are going to get a ton of stuff out of it. Um, if people want to, learn more about you, get in touch with you, follow you on anything. Um, where's the best place to do that? Sure. Um, and thanks for having me guys. That was awesome. Um, we have, man, I'm, I'm really bad at social media. I'll be honest with you. I'm like, you and me both. Yeah, man. It's so uh, you can, uh, you can check out our website. It's, um, Philadelphia 
and we just made this domain, so forgive me it's, if I can't remember exactly correct. It's uh, uh, I'm sorry, Philadelphia Real Estate Group. dot com. No, I'm sorry, man. I, I completely forget what our domain name is right now. Don't worry. But uh, I made it this far without without forgetting anything. That's yes. listen. Hey, more power to you. You've been doing this for quite some time, and you haven't. You know, I wish. You know, I wish I didn't need a social media press. It's just like it's the norm now. And yeah. It's, but I mean, you guys have been crushing it. So I mean, like I said, you know, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes, the right one. You know, just email sure. us or whatever. P- but uh, phrealestategroup.com. Oh, my apologies. There you go. <laughs> yeah, sorry. This is a this is a, a new. Uh, we switched domains a few times, so this is our newest uh, rendition um, with our new website. There but, you go. Uh, yeah, that's our website. Um, and you can uh, you can hit me up on that. It's uh, Gabe at phrealestategroup.com. Awesome. awesome. I uh, love it, guys. Uh, thank you so much for listening to the episode. If you're not already subscribed, please do so. If you are subscribed, would love it if you would send it to a couple friends who you think would find it helpful and educational and entertaining. Um, Gabe, thanks again so much for coming on. This was amazing. Cool, fellas. Thanks for having me. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, brother.